So, dobrý večer. Good evening, uh, everyone. I'm Przemysl Pala, director of the Czech Center, and I'm really delighted to see so many of you joining us this evening to celebrate the new uh, edition of Rusalka, which is basically coming back to town to the Royal Opera after 11 years. Uh, but even more years, uh, if my calculations are correct, it's going to be almost 120 two years when Rusalka was uh, premiered at the National Theatre in, uh, in Prague. Uh, as I spent some years in, in the state, uh, states, uh, most Americans would think that Dvořák is American, uh, surprisingly, <laughs> but despite the fact uh, they always acknowledge that Rusalka is coming from Bohemian land, so that's, uh, that was great. And uh, you might know uh, the story when the Rusalka was premiered in Prague uh, 1901 on 31st of March that actually uh, was endangered uh, almost didn't, didn't happen and maybe our distinguished panelists might elaborate a little bit on that but the, the leading tenor uh, voice uh, was a bit socially fatigued uh, but luckily the alternation uh, the lead uh, Bohumil Ptah, his name, uh, kind of stepped in and saved the date, and it was a great success. Rusalka, uh, the date in the National Theatre, and from now on, I think Rusalka is really cruising so many opera houses uh, around the around the world, and I'm uh, very glad that not, not any of these unexpected occurrences happened last night here at the Royal Opera, which was a wonderful performance. Uh, you might have also read the, the, the reviews, uh, very uh, very good reviews in today's papers of yesterday's uh, premiere. The Rusalka will be on stage till March uh, 7th. There are four, uh, five more performances. And I'm very pleased that we can uh, Welcome here, such a distinguished panelist, uh, to discuss these new editions of uh, Rusalka. So perhaps let me start introducing the panelists, uh, say, by the distance, uh, the, the longest mile, uh, so to speak, that uh, had to travel to London is Robert Simon, uh, who traveled across the Atlantic, uh, so he is American. Uh, He's a musicologist and a librarian, a great expert uh, on the Czech music, uh, editor. He's uh, editing musical scores of, uh, of course, uh, Dvořák, but also uh, Martinu or Pavel Haas. He's been professionally associated with a very good school, University of Notre Dame, down in Indiana, and currently at the Holy Cross College in uh, Massachusetts. So, uh, welcome. But uh, the, the, the second person I'd like to introduce is traveling, uh, came from uh, Prague, who worked also an uh, edition of the, the new uh, version of Rusalka, particularly on, on, on Libretto. He's also uh, the editor or, or chief editor of uh, the Berner Writer Publishing House uh, in Prague and he has been uh, receiving, he has received a prize uh, for, uh, for, for editing uh, Josef uh, Suk uh, Symphony uh, of Serial. I'm also very pleased uh, to introduce the person who being quite uh, intensively intensively uh, preparing for the last night and that's uh, Anna Blackmore. Uh, Anna, she's a graduate of the, the Royal College of Music. She's performing in many uh, orchestras including the BBC uh, Symphony Orchestra and uh, obviously she's a member of the Royal uh, Opera House where she's principal and second uh, violin. Uh, her violin is somewhere here. <laughs> and last but not least, before I turn the, the mic uh, to the chair of the panel, uh, which is Nigel uh, Smiona, which I'm very pleased is uh, 
experts indeed uh, on the Czech music, uh, uh, his musician by himself and writer, broadcaster on uh, many uh, outlets and he published uh, extensively on Czech music. <laughs> So with that, I also would like to thank our partners, which is the Dvořák's uh, Associations and the Balance Writer Publishing. Uh, so I wish you enjoy this wonderful evening, and I would like to turn the floor to you. Thank you very much. Funny old fact of history that Dvořák wrote more operas than symphonies, but I'm willing to bet that if you know Dvořák's music, you probably know more symphonies than operas. Rosalka very much is the, the one operatic work which has now got a really firm hold in the international repertory, though it has not been ever thus. Um, I looked just out of interest this morning at the first edition of Cobbe's opera book, the great big opera guide, you know, <coughs> which first came out in the 20s. And Dvořák isn't even in the index, let alone Rosalka, even though it was already a very popular and well-established piece, because after the slightly wonky premiere, uh, it was a huge success. The conductor of that premiere in 1901, by the way, was Karol Kovacevic, who many of you might know as the villain of the piece in the story of getting Janáček's Yenufer staged in Prague. He was the one who said he'd only do it if he could reorchestrate it, so he did. Uh, he was also quite a competent, if not always inspired composer, and rather a good opera conductor. So he was the um, person in charge of getting it on then. Simeon Bichkov is the person conducting it in the production that opened last night, um, which is incredibly beautiful and wonderfully played and, and, and sung. In many ways, um, Rosalka epitomizes uh, quite a lot of sort of late 19th century um, sort of operatic uh, tendencies, evocations of nature, the mysterious forces of the supernatural, elements of folk song and dance, and of course, Wagner. Um, in particular, Wagner's sort of love-death um, obsession as exemplified in famously, obviously, Tristan, but this is something that's also very apparent in, in Dvořák's opera, too. It was written quite quickly, surprisingly quickly, actually, in about six months, in 1900. Uh, and, but, but it's a weird and wonderful thing to think that, strictly speaking, Rosalka is a 20th century opera, first performed in 1901. Uh, and it's um, something that always slightly surprises me. We think of Dvořák as a composer from the glorious end of the 19th century, and here is this piece that was his penultimate opera. There was one more to go, a, a, a work called Armida, which those of us who really love Dvořák might quite enjoy. But I think... The other Dvořák opera that I think is worth getting to know is Rosalka's immediate predecessor called The Devil and Kate, which is a delightful and charming opera, quite different from Rosalka, but with equally glorious music, or nearly as glorious music. So let's hope that before too long, uh, Rosalka might not be the one and only opera that Dvořák wrote, but I don't think anyone's going to argue that it is his operatic masterpiece and it's what we're here to discuss. Now, the first thing, uh, the first person I want to talk to about this is Robert Simon who did the musical editing of the new edition. There is the full score of the new edition uh, in all its 800 pages of, 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 of beautifully printed glory. Um, and uh, it's obviously a mammoth undertaking a project like this. And one of the things that I'd like to explore um, is really how that process actually works and what decisions and so on Robert had to make in terms of deciding which versions to opt for. Um, there has been a big edition of Rusalka before, back in 1960, um, which uh, 
decided to take one decision, and Robert, uh, quite rightly in my view, uh, has taken a slightly different one, which we'll explore. Let's start, Robert, by talking about the sources for this opera, I mean, the musical sources. What did you decide to go for that the old edition of the full score didn't, and why? Absolutely, it was a massive undertaking, uh, all made worth it by the performance last night, so it was really a joy to, to see and hear uh, after all the work put into it. So we started um, with a slightly different approach than taken by Jarmil Burghauser, who did the 1960 edition, um, and he took Dvorak's autographed manuscript as his primary uh, source, and uh, we took of course, looking at the manuscript just as equally, but as our primary source, we took the uh, score from the National Theatre that was prepared from Dvorak's copy and used for all of the rehearsals and the premiere of the opera in 1901. And so this solved some issues and discrepancies uh, in the manuscript itself, in the autograph, and it also provided all of the commentary and changes made during that uh, uh, interactive process of, of rehearsal for the opera uh, in which it was created for the premiere. And there are oftentimes markings made in the theater score that were not made in uh, uh, own manuscript. Now, of course, each of those was considered carefully, checked back with uh, the original autograph and the other sources uh, that are uh, extant for the opera. That's very interesting. So essentially what you decided to go for was the opera as Dvorak left it rather than as he wrote it. In other words, what you get in this new edition is what they decided upon after it being heard in the theatre, it being trialled, it being rehearsed. Yes, in a way that is that is true, and also we reflected on, on changes uh, made by Dvorak in uh, other sources, primarily uh, the piano reduction. And so the piano reduction made for the rehearsals for the opera, which is just the piano with the vocal lines, so the entire orchestra is smashed down into uh, one piano part. Um, but the vocal lines particularly, uh, we can learn things about from these reductions, and that reduction from the theater uh, that was done as part of the material for the theater score, uh, at first, we, we considered it just as with the parts from the, the theater score, mm -hmm. that uh, it showed some evidence of rehearsal. But the more we looked at it, we found it contained not only changes authorized by Dvorak, but in his hand. And this is a source that the previous editor, Jorma Berghauser, uh, uh, essentially had either no knowledge of or or. or, or or Didn't think discounted, yeah. um, and so this allowed us to see especially changes made in the vocal lines, variants which then appeared in the first published edition uh, in 1905 of the piano reduction. We were able to connect those back to whether or not Borjak had actually authorized them. That is absolutely fascinating. So in other words, some of the uh, note text in, in the new score, it really does reflect changes you definitely know Dvorak himself made while the opera was in rehearsal. Yes, and those, and then, or, you know, confirmed after the fact. Um, of course. Yes. Well, then the vocals all came out uh, at a time when Dvorak was not in a position to confirm anything. <laughs> yes, so, so we have now sources from the theater score and then two intermediary sources of the piano reduction before the printed piano reduction, which was made after. This is this, exactly this is this is terribly interesting because the only the only printed material we have for this opera obviously came out the year after Dvorak died. Um, uh, so it's incredibly valuable to have these kind of working materials that we that we know he revised uh, when the thing was either being rehearsed or afterwards. Uh, but these are things that nobody really knew about before. Yeah, Jarmil Borghauser had no, uh, these sources were not known to him when he did the uh, edition that came out in 1960, these intermediary piano reductions. And so uh, Berghauser discounted entirely the piano reduction published in 1905 because he could not uh, uh, determine uh, its authenticity. I, I think there's a really interesting sort of side question here about 
um, the, the sort of, I suppose, what we might call the ethics of editing as they were viewed in 1960. Uh, I suppose if you were, a, you know, eager, in his case, uh, Burkhauser's case, vastly distinguished and, and experienced musicologist, but the thinking would have been, we must go back to Dvorak's handwritten manuscript that is going to tell us what he wanted. And of course, with something like an opera, it's far more complicated than that, because the minute the thing gets into rehearsal or onto the stage, not only the composer, but other people chip in with suggestions, revisions get made, of course, not only to the music, but to the text, as we'll be discussing in a little while. Um, so I think we're much more sensitive to that sort of thing now than, than was the case 55 years ago, would you agree? I think we're a bit more alert to the fact that the handwritten score is not necessarily the kind of, <laughs> the only bit of sort of holy writ when you're making an edition. I, I would say that that's, that's mostly true. I mean, Burkhauser, not to discount his work, did amazing uh, work looking back at the original, at the original autograph. But, but yes, this, this edition, the Dvořák complete edition that was done uh, in the 50s and 60s was done very quickly. Um, and, and again, with the sources known to them at the time. Uh, but yes, we've, we've taken, um, we're, we are building upon the work done by, by Burkhauser and, and again, looking at the sources uh, with, with fresh eyes. Well, can we put a bit of um, uh, sort of nuts and bolts into this? It would be very nice. Um, I, I, sh I should say that one of the, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll say this because Robert will be far too modest to say it, but one of the frustrations and agonies of editing is that months if not years, of unbelievably hard work, quite often it ends up sounding very like what, what was around before. That's not unfair, is it? Um, and yet, you have to have done all this work uh, to come up with, 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 with the text in the, in the form that, that you think the composer would have wanted it. it. It's often, in other words, a rather thankless task, which is another reason why it's so lovely to be celebrating this new edition this evening, because they're seldom celebrated the way they deserve to be. Um, so, uh, with that rider, um, I do know that there are some passages in Rosalka which, where we can actually see or hear um, uh, changes that were made be between these, these versions we've been talking about, the, the Dvorak's first handwritten manuscript, the copied score that was used by the conductor for the first performance, and the piano vocal scores that were used by the singers in rehearsals to, to learn their parts. So on having explained that. Yeah, and before that I'd like to just give a brief kind of introduction to some of these sources so that everyone else can see what uh, Jonas and I have been staring at um, for the past two, two years. Uh, if I may. So just as a sample, this is the title page from, from Rosalka from Dvorak's autograph manuscript. His sign off at the end of the work. Thanks God. Thanks, Thanks thank thank God. God, yes. Completed on November 27th in 1900. Uh, Dvorak is, is not <coughs> particularly known as being the most fastidious uh, of scribes. Uh, which makes the work uh, a bit challenging, uh, to, to, say, to say the least. Um, he started uh, work on the opera in, in purely a sketch form of uh, the, the vocal lines and then again the rest of the music in piano form. So this is the first page of the sketch um, that he began. But he began with the start of Act One. Which he began is, which is Act One. Fun. <laughs> yes. And wrote straight through. Um, and some other samples of of Dvorak's lovely uh, handwriting here, where in some cases he's made um, very, very nice, clear changes in uh, contrasting ink and pencil, but we also have to navigate his imprecisely written slurs and dots throughout, uh, which can be very fun. Uh, uh, in, in other terms, again, um, uh, changes made in pencil to various notes. 
And sometimes we find um, Dvorak making markings in the margins uh, here simply in pencil uh, giant question marks, which are very entertaining to try and sort out what exactly uh, they mean. Uh, but of course, there are such joys in going to these original sources, and there are uh, little things that, uh, that really connect you with the humanity of the composer. Uh, in this note here, um, this is written in, on the page, one of the last pages of Rosalka's uh, Song to the Moon, the Song to the Moon aria, and he notes here that he completed um, this, the orchestration, um, on, uh, on the birthday of his daughter. Uh, in Prichovica, where she was likely staying with her and uh, her husband, uh, Josef Suk. So, Again, the fact that in very, he rarely notates dates except beginnings and endings, but here he notated he completed this, this very famous aria uh, on his daughter's birthday. And when I created the next example, I didn't know we would be sitting in front of it, so we might have to part ways. But this is my favorite page in the entire manuscript. It is written over, pasted over, with all of Dvorak's markings, and here, at the very bottom, he has written, and this will show, uh, I worked on this page for three hours. <laughs> and, and never before have I connected with work more than seeing the composer write for posterity in his autograph his frustration with this page that he's worked on this for three hours. Uh, so. So with that interlude, um, uh, we'll go to some uh, specific examples here. Uh, but this is also another example of, this is from the theater score. And one of the challenges of the theater score is that it was used continuously after the initial premiere. And so numerous conductors, uh, including uh, Václav Tadek, worked with the score. And we have to decipher down through the various layers of markings. In this case, a cut was made and then it was marked, don't play, and then that was crossed out, and then say, no play. So trying to uncover down to the lowest layer of, of markings is, uh, is always, again, another one of these lovely challenges. And then here, the, another score. Uh, this is the piano score, um, reduction from the theater score, with Vorjok's markings in both pencil and pen on this source that was previously uh, ignored. So. So here's one example um, of where we made a change. And uh, I think, um, Jonas, would you like to discuss the Okoslan example? OK. <laughs> so in this case, this is a page from the autograph manuscript um, with then uh, detail um, here at the bottom, likely right behind my head. Uh, and in this case here, nothing but Okoslan. Dvorak, and you can't see quite well, but this is what we are doing, we are looking at. In this case, the flag on the fourth uh, eighth note uh, is written in pencil. So Dvorak originally omitted this flag, which did not create enough beats in the bar. But from that mistake, leaving out that single flag, the theater score was copied. And people looked at it and said, there aren't enough beats in the bar, uh, or there are too many, too many beats in the bar, and changed the rhythm. And then that was copied, and then that was copied, and that was printed, and that was copied. And it became a, a tradition that we still receive questions on. Mm -hmm. uh, and Vojra corrected it quite clearly afterwards, but in pencil. Uh, and so we know his intention of that he wanted this. And that is what we have uh, restored back in this, uh, in this edition. So um, we have uh, two examples, uh, one of which was uh, uh, from Macaris, a uh, recording of Charles Macaris, uh, in which they are performing the old version. So I will ask now to play example two. Yeah. <laughs> 
nowhere, yes. <laughs> and now um, the, uh, the next example, which would be example one, this is the performance done in, uh, done in Prague just in the past uh, September with our edition, uh, restoring uh, Dvořák's original intention of the uh, four eighth notes. Can you hear the difference in the, in the rhythm? That surprisingly, sorry, I will just say, sorry, uh, surprisingly, uh, the second one was the Makaras recording with the correct variant, whereas whereas in, in the Prague performance, first performance from our edition, uh, unfortunately, the singer didn't learn the, uh, uh, the correct rhythm and uh, 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 repeated the rhythm which he had already known. So this is also the destiny of, of, of editors that simply you, you create or restore the, the, uh, the uh, correct variant, but then still the singer, which was, who was incredibly good, but, but simply sang the other one, unfortunately. <laughs> And also, the other aspect of, of this, um, uh, sorry, is uh, the declamation, because in Czech language, we have uh, the accents uh, almost always on the first syllable, to, to say it simply. Okouzlen, oko, there's the accent, but, but both accents into music as if uh, the accent uh, were on the second syllable, okouzlen, and um, uh, seen by the um, uh, Aesthetics at the time, it was a wrong one, a wrong declamation, and Bozak was also criticized for it. But now we have <laughs> not such a big problem with his way uh, setting uh, Czech language into the music. But maybe this was also one of the motivations why they tried to adjust it, yes. adjust the rhythm to put the first syllable of the word Okozlen on the third beat. But Bozak's original is clear, is with this written and nothing else. <laughs> yes, and uh, again, as as the editor, I still just assume that, and quite incorrectly, that the the new the, the new <laughs> example was the correct one. <laughs> Alas, <laughs> so, the, the the fate. So, um, it's worth saying, of course, that we keep talking about Dvořák's Rosalka, and of course, so we should. But actually, Dvořák's Rosalka and Yaroslav Kvapil's Rosalka, because someone had to write the words, which is what I want to talk about next. Uh, Kvapil was quite an experienced playwright um, who went on to hold very distinguished positions at the, at the National Theatre. Um, but the story of this libretto is quite complicated because, as far as I can see, he offered it to several composers before it ended up on Dvořák's desk, one of whom was even his son-in-law, Josef Suk. Um, so this, the libretto was written, and it's this, it's this rather wonderful amalgam of um, Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid, which has quite a lot of similarities uh, with it, uh, La Motte Fouquet's Undine, again, with which it has quite a lot of similarities. And yet, once it had got Kvapil's treatment, it very much came within the orbit of the sort of mildly terrifying fairy tales and folk tales that so appealed to Dvořák in the last years of his life, particularly those by Carol Erben, uh, which formed the basis of Dvořák's tone poems that were written at about the same time as this opera, this wonderful clutch of late orchestral and stage works that all came out in sort of Dvořák's post-American, uh, what we might call an Indian summer, but actually it was of course a bohemian one in his case. Um, and so Kvapil produced this libretto, which is uh, a, 
very successful amalgam of various elements of sort of European folklore, but also giving it a, 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 a very Czech flavor in the process. Um, I think, though, that those rather mixed origins uh, go a very long way to explaining why this opera has such a ready international appeal, because the story is from a very cosmopolitan group of elements. It's not, you know, a Czech folk tale that might need a bit of explaining to people who, who, who don't know Czech folk stories. It's, it's a kind of international, a cosmopolitan one. And I think that's one reason why it does find such a ready acceptance on uh, stages all over the world. Um, but back to the libretto. Um, music may quite often get um, slightly mistreated by uh, singers, uh, but words, Jonas, are another thing altogether, because words are absolutely massacred by uh, singers quite often. Um, uh, partly because sometimes they have memory lapses, that's completely excusable and explainable. Sometimes because they've learned it wrong and that's the way it's gone into their singer brains and that's how it stays. Um, uh, there, there, are, there are umpteen reasons why this could happen, but, but Jonas, how on earth did you go about establishing a dare I say, definitive version of the libretto? That's the first question. And the second one is, how do you persuade singers to learn it? <laughs> <laughs> the, the latter one is a, a very difficult question. <laughs> uh, uh, to the former one. Uh, yes, uh, when we started our work, it was uh, pretty clear that we also have to have to uh, edit the libretto, which became uh, my task, next to accompanying uh, Robert's uh, editorial work on the full score. Uh, uh, so uh, I took this this uh, libretto libretto task, and uh, well, it was also a great great joy because the libretto is of course uh, very good, as as you have mentioned. Uh, so I did um, a similar thing, compared all the all the all the uh, extant sources, and found out a very surprising thing that, <coughs> although Jaroslav Papil uh, wrote later in his memoirs that um, uh, Dvořák uh, took his libretto. Uh, as he wrote it, word by word, uh, it is not 100% uh, true. Yes, he didn't uh, uh, write or new arias or things like that, but in the detail, he did change um, uh, accents, um, uh, syllables, punctuation, and simply in detail, um, he, he adapted uh, Papel's words uh, to come as close as possible to his musical imagination. And we uh, have to take uh, this seriously as part of his intention, because the changes are, are distinctive and uh, are, uh, uh, it can be proven that it's simply part of the intention and it's not a mistake. Oh, that's extremely interesting, a absolutely. And I think there's the occasional uh, uh, moment in the, in the, the letters between uh, Dvořák and Frappel where Dvořák says, oh look, I need two extra lines for the end of this aria or something. But that was simply because, uh, you know, while he did follow the text incredibly faithfully and uh, essentially built the music around the, the words, uh, just occasionally, you know, he ran out of words uh, and, and needed some more. And Frappel seems to have been more than happy to help out in any way possible. So obviously bits of the libretto, fragments, come from much later in the process than the bulk of it, because there were little fixes that needed making. Uh, yes, yes, we have these two letters from Dvořák uh, to Papil, uh, who mainly worked together in Prague, but during his summer stay in Vysoka, he wrote uh, uh, letters uh, Dvořák to Papil, so thanks to this, uh, to this summer, summer, summer house in Vysoka, we have also uh, a very astonishing documentation yes. uh, on, on this, on this uh, Happy, happy cooperation between between both artists. Yes, and uh, maybe if I may, I would like to uh, present also one um, audible change. Of course, if there are different words or di different syllables, 
it, it can be uh, it can be heard. And uh, the surprising moment is also that uh, Dvořák uh, was uh, quite carefree about uh, Kvapel's original rhymes because the libretto is rhymed, and sometimes he simply destroyed the rhyme uh, in sake of of, uh, of of music of of, yes. of the melody, and some of these. Destroyed rhymes are part of the traditional sound libretto, but uh, at some other other places uh, we can uh, restore similarly some other variants where also Gorak uh, didn't take the rhyme or, uh, or change uh, the original text slightly. So um, here, this is the this is the example. Uh, it's uh, from the third act uh, where the first wood name sings in Rodney Bloomer's translation. Mine golden hair is mine. Glowworms dance around it at the close of day. And if I translate literally, uh, Kvapil says. Glowworms are flocking to them. Svatojanské mušky slétají se k ním, to them, uh, to, the, to the her. Uh, whereas Gořák changes to Svatojanské mušky slétají se k nám. Glowworms are flocking to us. And I was very happy to hear this old, new uh, Bořák's variant yesterday at the premiere. Ah. And, and it's, it has its a, it's a reason, because as you can see, there is a dotted crotchet, the long note and the long syllable, knam, is of yeah. course much better, uh, suits the, the, the melody much better than uh, the short one by Papil. Yeah. So we have to take it seriously and uh, <coughs> take it. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that. I mean, uh, have you, uh, I, I'm being sort of slightly facetious when I said how do you persuade singers to, to learn these changes, but it sounds as if singers are coming round to uh, learning this new text quite happily, or the changes in the text quite happily. Well, they need to use the new uh, uh, piano vocal score, and I also have to underline the wonderful work of uh, the language coaches. Uh, ah. Because there are, there was no Czech singer in the ensemble, but the Czech was admirable. So. Yeah, that, that's Thank lovely you. to hear. <laughs> um, let's turn to the sound it actually makes. Um, Anna is principal second violin in the opera orchestra. Um, I uh, went to the dress rehearsal, which is then had a different Rusalka in it. That's a whole other story. Um, uh, Jonas and Robert went to the first night last night. Anna, of course, was very much involved in both of those things. And uh, for the last part of this chat, I really want to talk to her about the sound of the wonderful sound of this of this of this score. It's it's a sort of strange amalgam of the most beautiful kind of shimmering na nature music impressionism and 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 then suddenly snatches of. Slavonic dances, and it's 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 quite glorious. What's it like to play, Emma? It's amazing to play. I have to say, my colleagues and I, we there's you know there's a few productions every year that are kind of highlighted as a as a sort of pinnacle of your year, and this has been been coming for for the for the music or for Selka, for the conductor with mm -hmm. Lemmy and Bitchkoff, and it's one of those. One of those productions that, and it's really um, delivered, I think, yeah. in that way. Um, you you asked me originally what um, what makes this kind of seemingly easy score, you know, what makes it hard, and um, so I had a think, and I actually spoke to um, Maestro Bitchkov because I thought you'd be interested to to hear what he had to say, and his first comment, as I said to you before, was, well. And people think that Mozart is very easy. So, um, <laughs> in a similar way, I suppose Dvořák had such a talent for for melodic writing, and in that way, the sophistication, I suppose, that's required to bring it off the page and bring it to the next level is um, deceptive because it's so beautiful. To but there's to. also, uh, I mean, from a purely practical point of view, he has a taste for absolutely beastly keys <laughs> uh, to write the music yeah, in. Just yeah. to explain to anybody that isn't quite getting what I'm talking about, uh, you know, 
sharps and flats, um, and there are passages in, 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 this, in this score, notably the most famous number in it, uh, Rosalka's uh, Song to the Moon, uh, which has uh, got as many flats as flats can be. Um, and the very end is... And the, next sec and then the next second you're changing to seven sharps, and, it, the next yeah, yeah. and it's just... Um, there's so much character in so understanding the tonality when it changes so quickly is a is a big thing. But the I think one of the biggest challenges for us um, with this score is that when you when you look into it, the polyphony in the score is so complex, mm -hmm. and I think it comes from the melodic writing being th through the whole orchestra. So there are so many of you at the same time with melodic writing that means that it's unbelievably thick. So the kind of artistry and um, skill and understanding it takes um, to balance that, not only within the orchestra but with, with the stage, which is obviously an age-old problem for us, <laughs> daily, balancing with the stage um, is... Is quite extreme. But, but you have to do that with with any opera. I of mean, course, you, uh, yeah. But but with Rosalka, it's yeah because it's so cute, thick with, with the melodic theme. right. Yeah, so dense, and because all the, all parts are so melodic, so it's incredibly rich. There are some really odd aspects to the orchestral writing. Uh, I mean, in the most famous number of all, the the song to the moon, uh, quite early on in Act One, that Rosalka sings. Um, uh, Dvorak does something which e every orchestration manual would tell you never, ever, ever to do, if you, especially if you don't want to drown the voices. He actually has a trumpet playing, doubling uh, Rosalka's melody. The trumpet plays exactly the same notes mm -hmm. uh, as she is singing. This ought to be a complete nightmare. It's mm -hmm. the most magical and beautiful sound provided incredible care it's, is taken. It's, it's taken and I think every all the way through I think most of the of the singing lines are doubled by something yeah sort of with the trumpet that's oh. more but there's always it's Clarence always or what exactly you, yeah. exactly yes. um but the other big thing also with um Dvorak's opera is that stylistically he changes so much so um you're playing, there's a lot of um, kind of bohemian Slavic music, so the more traditionally Dvorak music that we know, the, the fresh kind of folky music, and the next second you're going into kind of Wagnerian, there's a lot of Wagnerian writing in this opera, <coughs> which um, I don't know how well you know Wagner operas, but there's so much Lohengrin and um, Rheingold, those are the two that, and um, then the next moment, there's a big sway of Act Two that is very, very Schubertian, and it's just a completely different style of playing. So you're um, constantly, your brain is changing. You know, articulation, sound world, color, vibrato, on top of everything else. The styles he uses are just endless. Well, one you mentioned earlier on when we were nattering about this, which, 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 very much rang bells with me, was that you, you were hearing similarities with a piece that came after as well as one that came before, which was Janacek's Katia Kamanova. Yeah. Which particular bits are you thinking of? Well, there's this, um, in Act One, um, that's when I mainly hear Janacek, and there's the different, there's a varied, interestingly, um, Dvořák was a viola player, which I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone knows he was a viola player, and he writes so beautifully for the viola always. So his chamber works, the the string quintets, the string quartets, which I played a lot of, the symphonies, there's always the viola part is great. And when I mentioned to my um, to my colleague, the principal viola, um, about the score and how melodic all the writing is, she said, yeah, in every part apart from ours, she said she played one melody, and that's at the very last page when we all play the melody together. So, <laughs> interestingly, but, but she has a lot in her part of, um, as we all do, of the kind of frenzied, um, Janáček-y kind of the the sort material. Of busy little figurations. That, Very busy. That are extremely fit exactly. To play. Exactly. Yeah. And the um, some of the chords in Act One. There's I I, I can show you later if you want. Some of the chords they remind me so much of Janáček. It's the kind of that feeling of like eerie feeling where you don't really know what key you're in. It's all a bit yeah. 
Uh, actually, that's very true um, about a lot of Rusalka. It's a real um, sort of fingerprint of the of the opera. I think. I mean, shout me down if I'm talking nonsense. But but Georgia, particularly in Rusalka, just as in the late tone poems, loves taking these seeming wrong turns into mm -hmm. goodness knows what sort of key or chord. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's all moving along very serenely, and suddenly. You know, it, 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 it's like the, the floor drops out of it, and suddenly you're, where are we now? It's yeah. wonderfully disorientating. And definitely, and from being very, very rich in texture, suddenly things drop out and there's a sparse chord, which actually, in Janicek, I think, um, intonation, kind of tonality-wise, is a bit easier because it's so wacky. Mm. But with with Bojack, that it's so melodic and actually tonal in most parts that actually it's key. Even there's a chord, um, interestingly, in the wind that has um, my my colleague, the principal flute, was telling me she has she plays um, a note a three octaves lower. The bassoon, principal bassoon, is playing. Um, but they aren't the base of the chord. So there's things like that. It just makes it so tricky because you're matching, but you're not the base of the chord. So right, and, yeah, and it comes out of, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But because it's so um, tonal and so melodic, it, it, it matters very much. Last point, Anna. Mm. Um, obviously, there are, there are operas and operas as an orchestral player. There are mm -hmm. ones that are a, a, a sort of joy to play. There are mm -hmm. the ones that, well, you play because it's work. Um, where does this sort of sit on that scale? I, I tend to think of the orchestra as so so important in this opera. It's, mm. it's, it's more or less a kind of protagonist up there with absolutely. the principles. I, I yeah. would say. My impression is that it's an absolute delight to play, but uh, as well as being tricky. It really is. And I have to say, in the alone rehearsals that we do before the singers come, when we're rehearsing with, with um, Maestro Bitchkoff, I think the orchestra is in heaven because it's it's actually it's such a symphonic work that um, it could actually stand alone with with no singing and it happily did before they came along. Oh, <laughs> and I think a lot of us were kind of thinking of our you know symphonic careers we, before and things because we're, it really does feel. We're fine you know, with this. We really yeah, we're really good at this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all three of you very much. Um, I. Uh, we've got just time for a, for a few quick questions. Uh, if they turn out to be long, complicated, and exciting questions, we can continue them, obviously, over a, a drink or, or two afterwards. But if there are fairly quick questions that people want to throw into the ring now, please do ask this amazing group of people. Um, and <coughs> and we, ah, oh, Simon, microphone coming your way. Nigel, it's a question to you and Anna, really. Um, it's, uh, what do you think held Vorjak's earlier operas back from the repertoire? Is it the subject matter? Is it the librettos? Is it that he hadn't discovered a, 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 a voice that was distinctive enough? I wonder what it was. Um, and, and the second question, just to put it to, to Anna, is um, do you think his orchestration changed in his last 20 years? Because the... Elgar always said, Elgar led the orchestra in Birmingham for the Sixth Symphony under Borjak and always said that the great thing which he loved about his orchestration was its economy. And I wondered whether, the, when you're talking about the thickness of Rosalka, whether that changed in the last 20 years of his writing. Um, I'll just say a very quick word about the earlier operas, um, and then I'm sure Robert and you and I shall have something to add. Um, to be absolutely honest, I think what they lack, in many cases, is really great ideas. They're perfectly competent pieces of work. Dvorak, of course, had been a theatre musician himself. He, he knew how opera worked. So, in terms of how they how they how they sort of work, have meshed together, they're perfectly competent pieces of work. But what they're by and large short of is truly memorable material, that which is busting out all over in Rosalka. Um, and I think to a considerable extent in The Devil and Kate as well, which I definitely would bang the drum for um, too. But uh, I, I think it, I personally think it's as simple as that. There's some very lovely moments. Uh, the Jacobin's got some terrific music in it. Um, and 
Dimitri has its plans. Um, my dear old friend John Tyrrell was one of them. He thought it was a terrific piece. Um, so they're all worth looking at. They're not sort of negligible, but they, the trouble is Rosalka is so much better. Uh, it's, 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 it's bound to be the one that, that comes out on top. Um, Anna, uh, Simon's point about um, the orchestra. <coughs> So I think I'm answering the question of saying that I, I think in um, he went away. So at the begin at the beginning he was so hugely influenced by Wagner as he went away, and I think in the time probably he wrote the symphonies. I think quite similarly to Brahms, he was very romantic in style but classically notated. So I think that as he came back and at the end of his life, I think I'm right in saying this from the feeling I have also playing it is that he came kind of more back to Wagner and the thickness and um, I guess it's highlighted also because it's an opera so you'll have the stage too rather than with the symphony but my feeling is that it, it became in that way more, more thickly notated. I, I, I think the other thing you might add, I'm sure you've played them, the two mass quartets, yeah. there's a lot of very busy writing in them, yeah. you know, uh, or, yeah. but more than in, in uh, earlier on. It's 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 fascinating because uh, you know Dvorak was a ludicrously experienced composer by this point in his career, and yet he was always looking for ways to evolve. Uh, and I think his his orchestral writing in Rusalka is in. I mean, it, it has its problems and the. the Anna's ex explained about things like balance, but my goodness me, it's beautiful. I mean, once you've solved those problems, it's astonishingly gorgeous. I mean, gorgeous is, a, is, a, is an adjective that is not applied to many operas that end up with, you know, dead people on the stage, but Rosalga is, is one, of the, one of the ones where I think it's a, it's a, a very proper way to describe the, the, the quite fabulous sound it makes. It, it's, it's breathtakingly beautiful. It, it's probably one that also one of the reasons why it does work very well in um, recordings. If you can't get to see it in a theatre, it's an opera that works absolutely wonderfully on, on CDs or whatever is your preferred sound carrying medium. Um, uh, because, as Anna was saying, it, it, it's, each act has, has a kind of symphonic span. Uh, and, and very much feels that way, so it's a very absorbing experience, just even without anything to see on the stage. Have we got any other questions? Yes, gentleman over there. I'm sorry, lady over there. <laughs> I sign not what it was, no, no. I beg your pardon. <laughs> I'd like to return, please, to the question of coaching, and I wonder how of where Covent Garden is of the Emmy Destin Foundation. Emmy Destin was a Czechoslovak opera singer, and the foundation does a lot of work to coach young opera singers in Czech. And I think that's vital if they're going to be able to sing these operas, Rusalka and others. And I wonder just to what extent this foundation is known about. Um, rather alarmingly, we don't seem to have much to offer on this, except to say that obviously what you say is, is absolutely right. Good language coaching um, at places like Covent Garden is completely indispensable. Um, uh, as Jonas was saying, um, uh, I think, or, or Robert, well, uh, it's been particularly successful uh, this time round for, for Rosalka, as it was actually last year for Yenifer and a couple of years ago for Katja Kavanova. So uh, I, I think, I, I don't know about the Destin Foundation's work, it sounds like we ought to talk about that afterwards, but I'm, mm. I, I'd certainly say that, it, that the language coaching seems to be in extremely good hands. At least one of the people who did the language coaching for Rosalka is a brilliant pianist and musical director who did a quite marvellous sort of miniature production of The Coming Little Vixen a few weeks ago. Uh, from the, she directed it from the piano and it was absolutely breathtaking. So it's a really good team um, at the Royal Opera House 
uh, both in terms of language coaching and in terms of uh, music staff because they very much put the A-team onto this project, I think, from, from the beginning. Uh, when you look through the credits for who was, you know, who the rehearsal pianists were and things, you think, oh, they did all right then because they had all the best people um, uh, doing it. It's a remarkable team effort putting on an opera um, at, that, at the sort of level Common Garden uh, habitually operates. The complexity of it is absolutely astonishing. Um, going, you know, looking through the, the program, uh, the sort of fine print in the program um, uh, as an opera production is uh, actually vastly more entertaining than in a lot of other things where you have huge lists of names of people afterwards. Because with the opera, uh, almost everyone there has done something incredibly significant, um, even if they're not really terribly recognized for that including things like coaching the singers and making sure they sing the right words and indeed the right notes. Um, and that's, that's before you even get to the orchestra and the conductor. Um, uh, and it's almost before you get to the, to, 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 to the, to the singers. It's, it's, it's a wonderfully complex operation. Do, for goodness sake, go and see it if you, if you can. Uh, there are still um, cheap seats available. Uh, well, there are expensive ones available too, but I think there, there, is a, there are some uh, cheap seats, and if you're fit and or young, um, the standing seats are a complete and utter, standing places at Covent Garden are a complete and utter bargain, and are in a jolly nice part of the theatre, sort of back of the stall circle, you get a very good view, and the sound's quite good, and it's eight quid to get in? It, it's un unbelievably cheap, anyway. Um, uh, it's 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 such a it's such a glamorous building. It, 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 it's it's almost almost hard to believe that you 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 can really do a bargain basement version of it, but you actually can, even for something as uh, glamorous as this. I was going to ask one last question: Is this production being filmed for DVD or something? Or Okay, so it might end up on a DVD or it might be a live. It might be, yeah. If we still have one minute, there is another interesting thing concerning libretto, because libretto is not only the sung text, but of course uh, the stage directions as well. And here I have to mention uh, the name of the, of the regisseur of the, uh, of the first production, Robert Polak. Uh, um, who is um, probably author of extended stage directions, which also appeared in the 1905 uh, printed uh, piano reduction. And uh, uh, you uh, may remember that in the second act there is a quite a long orchestral passage without singing, it's a so-called Nepolonaise or a ceremonial music uh, with ballet, which Kozak originally didn't want. And uh, both, uh, neither Kvapil nor Kozak have um, any action there. There's also uh, only written uh, lights are lit, the guests promenade and form groups. And that's all. And I have to say, and it concerns also the newest production that uh, the action of, of uh, the characters was outlined actually, um, astonishingly, by this very first regisseur of Rusalka, that prince is coming together with the duchess, right. or the so-called foreign princess, and uh, what Rusalka doing, and the ballet is being danced. This is all invention of Robert Pollard. This must be said, and it still has its impact on, uh, on the tradition. Ah, that's a tremendously interesting. Uh, wonderful point. Thank you very much. A great moment on which to end. Can I thank you all very much for coming? Can I thank this wonderful panel for giving us so many insights into this beautiful work? And can I thank Czech Centre for having us in the first place and having the lovely idea of this evening to celebrate not only Dvořák's glorious operatic masterpiece, but also uh, its rebirth in this beautiful new edition and wonderful new production at the Royal Opera House. Thank you all very much. <laughs>